Today we're going to talk about the probate process from start to finish. It's going to vary from state to state, but I think most states are going to follow a similar process. But it really just depends on where you're located, so check with a local estate planning and probate attorney in your area. Generally, in most states, they will follow this process that I'm going to describe today. The first thing that happens is, well, you need to go and visit with a probate attorney. And I know a lot of people try to do this all by themselves, but we get a number of people coming to our office who have already started a probate, figured out how complicated it is, and wanted us to take over from that point going forward. So the first thing is you meet with a probate attorney, an estate planning attorney, and you discuss what has happened. Your loved one has passed away, and there are assets that need to be probated or distributed to the beneficiaries. And that's the problem, is there has to be a process to get all of their assets together and then distribute them to all of their heirs and along the way, pay the expenses for funeral, pay any creditors that are out there, and pay the cost of the probate, which would include court fees and attorney fees. So once you've visited with your attorney, they're going to have a lot of questions about who your loved one was, where did they live, what county did they live in, what state did they live in, and all that is important because usually in most states, the estate has to be probated in a district court that the person actually lived in. And things can be a little bit different if they had property or real estate in two different states. But we won't get into that today. Once we kind of figure out what is going on, we will file what's called a petition for probate. And again, it depends on which state you're in, but usually what happens is we go down to the courthouse with that petition for probate, and whoever our client is who's wanting to be the personal representative of the estate will sign swearing to all the facts in that petition for probate. Once we file that with the district court, we will usually get a hearing date about 30 days into the future, depending on how busy the courts are. And that could be 30, 40, 50 days into the future. And we need to publish it in the newspaper. Until that hearing happens, there really is nothing to do except for try to find assets that are out there. And unfortunately, without going to that first hearing, you really don't have the authority to look through mail, go to the bank, or really do anything at that point. At that first hearing, 30, 40 days into the future, we will have a hearing and the court will determine three things. The first one is whether they have jurisdiction to actually hear the probate in their district court. In other words, the person probably passed away or they had real estate in the county, district court county where we're at. And if they do, then they go on to the second item. And that is to appoint somebody as the personal representative or the executor of the estate, meaning that person will get what's called letters of administration. The third thing that happens in most states is at that same hearing, the court determines who all the heirs are of the estate. So that could be brothers and sisters, or if they were married, it could be their wife or their children, just depending on whether they had a will or didn't have a will. But that's another video on intestate succession. So once the court has decided those three things, that it has jurisdiction, appoint somebody as the executor, personal representative, and determines who the heirs are, then the next thing that usually happens is we file what's called notice to creditors. And what that means is we're literally giving creditors notice that there has been a probate filed and it has actually started. Creditors, again, it depends on state to state, but they might have 30 or 60 or 90 days to come forward and file a claim with the district court against the estate. So this could be a doctor, an ambulance service, a credit card. It could really be any creditor that's out there that has a legitimate claim against the estate. So they have that time period, like I say, usually 60, 30, 60, 90 days to come forward and file that claim against the estate. During that 60 day period or whatever it is in your state, what we usually do is we get with the personal representative or the executor and we start looking for assets. We start asking banks how much money is in there. Because remember, at that first hearing, we got what's called letters of administration. And those are those magical papers that will allow banks to talk to you, will hopefully allow you access to safe deposit boxes and allow you to talk to other financial institutions and sometimes even medical professionals if we need to look at records, what happened at the time of their death. Very important. So during that time period, what we try to do is put everything into one bucket. So I like to think of it as kind of the one bucket method. Usually people have a bank account here, a bank account there, a bank account over there and other financial institutions. They might have stocks, they might have bonds, whatever it is. 
if nobody in the family wants to keep any of those stocks, bonds, whatever it is, then what we usually try to do is just sell them all off or withdraw all of that money and put it into one bank account, the estate bank account. How do we get that estate bank account? How do we open it? We had to get those letters of administration that I told you about, those magical papers. And then we had to go to the IRS with those magic papers and get what's called an EIN number. That's an employment identification number. And the reason you need that, because while you're alive, you have a social security number. And that's what you use to open a bank account. But when you pass away, your social security also passes away with you. We have to get what's called an EIN number with the letters of administration to open an estate bank account. So we find all the little buckets that are, that are out there and put everything, all the money into one bucket. If there's real estate and the heirs don't want to own a piece of real estate with their brothers and sisters, in almost 80, 90% of the cases, we help them sell the property. So in order to sell the property, because it belongs to the estate, we have to go to the court and ask them for permission to sell the property. And there's different ways of doing that. In most states, there's a pretty simple way that if every, all the heirs consent to selling the property, then the judge will agree to allow the personal representative to sell the property without further judicial intervention. So that really makes it easy for the personal representative executor to hire a real estate agent and immediately sell the property as soon as possible. And what happens when it sells? The title company writes a check to the estate and the money from that check gets put into the estate bank account, into that one bucket. We usually wait until the notice to creditors has run before we start actually paying some of the creditors or evaluating whether or not the claim is actually a valid claim. There could be a, a lot of reasons why it might not be a valid claim. One reason is they wait too long to file it with a district court. Remember I told you in, in some states they have 60 days to come forward? Well, if they come forward on the 90th day or 120th day, they're past the time period for presenting that claim. So it might get denied on that basis. It also might be denied on just being a fraudulent claim. And surprisingly, that sometimes happens. People will read the newspapers and see where probates are and they'll just make a fictitious claim against the estate. And so we have to sift through those to make sure that they are actually legitimate claims. Once we pay off the creditors and we kind of figure out where all the money is and we put it into a bucket, we will file what's called an inventory and appraisement. So in other words, a personal representative or executor will say, this is what it belongs to the estate. We sold the house for $150,000. The person had another $200,000 in various bank accounts. Everything's together in the estate bank account now and we have $350,000, $400,000 now in the estate. And we file that with the court. And that's actually a requirement in most states that you have to file an inventory of exactly what is in the estate. Now, if the heirs decide to keep the property, then on that inventory and appraisement, we would actually just list the house out and the value, the appraised value of the house of $150,000, and then we'd also lift out, list out the bank account, the estate bank account. So it'd still be $350,000, $400,000, but we would list them as separate line, line items because the house has not been sold. So once we've done all that, then we actually look at the creditors, decide whether we're going to pay them or not. If the personal representative decides, yes, this is a legitimate claim, we're going to pay it, then we will sign a form, and that form actually has to be approved by the district judge. So just because the personal representative thinks it's a legitimate claim, it still has to go to the judge for approval. We've paid all the creditor claims. We've denied some of them. We've done an inventory. We have everything in the estate bank account now. Now what happens? Well, the next step is to file what's called a final account. That final account will tell the judge and the world that this is what we did. We sold the house. Now the money from the sale of the house is in the bank account. They had various other financial accounts. We put all of that into the estate bank account. So judge, world, this is what is in the estate. Kind of like the inventory, but what we're also telling the judge is that we have done, or the personal representative or executor, depending on what state you're in, has done everything that they're supposed to for this probate. In other words, we're ready to close the probate down and distribute it to the heirs. We file that final account, and depending on what state you're in, when you file it, then you have to set it for hearing, because there has to be a final hearing in the future 
to hear that final account. We go to the district court, we file it, we talk to the judge's staff, and we get a date, usually at least 30 days, 40 days into the future, and we need to publish it. At that final hearing, if everything has gone perfectly and nobody appears to contest the will, the probate, anything, then the judge will usually say, okay, personal representative, you've done everything you're supposed to do. Now I need you to distribute the assets, everything that's in that estate bank account, that one bucket, to whoever the heirs are. And the judge has already determined, remember, at the first hearing who those heirs are. So if the judge determined that there were three heirs, he orders the personal representative to divide the estate between those three heirs. Once the personal representative has done that, it's done. The estate is finally finished. Now, I went through this very quickly, but if you noticed the time frame, the very first thing we had to file was a petition. Depending on where you are, that might be 30 days or 40 days into the future before you can actually have a hearing. Let's just do 30 for this example. Once we have that hearing, then we have to file notice to creditors. And again, it depends on where you are, how long creditors have to come forward. For our purposes, let's just say it's 60 days. Now we're looking at 30 days for the petition, 60 days for the notice to creditors. That's already three months, guys. And then we do the final account and we have to wait at least another 30 days. You're looking at a minimum four months to finish a probate, depending on where you are, if everything goes smoothly. You know it's probably not going to go smoothly. The first thing, there's a lot of probates in district courts. And that means even though a statute may say you need to have a hearing at least 30 days into the future, judges, staff might look at calendar and say, that's fine, but the soonest opening we have is 50 days from now. That can happen at each step of the way. Legitimately, a probate is going to last you probably five, six, seven months easily. We've had probates that have lasted two, three years. And again, it just depends on the complexity, what assets are out there, and the number one thing that determines whether or not it's going to be a quick probate or a long probate is whether or not the family members are going to fight. If nobody fights, everybody gets along, then it's going to be a smooth probate and it will be over fairly quickly within that four to six month period. That's the probate process start to finish. And you're probably wondering, is there a better way to do this? Of course there is. You've heard me talk about it a million times. And that is to have a revocable living trust centered estate plan in place so that when you do pass away, you don't have to go to the probate court and your successor trustee can distribute all of your assets very quickly, usually in a month or two. Again, depending on the complexity. But you don't have to go through the expense of paying for a probate, which can be very expensive very quickly. 